rise and shine. Pour yourself a cup of coffee and tune in to Good Morning Aurora. News, weather, and really cool interviews. Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 a.m. Good morning, Aurora. Good morning, Aurora. Good morning, Aurora. The time is 7.19 a.m. You are listening to Good Morning, Aurora, the second largest city's first daily news podcast. It is Monday, the 19th of April, 2021. Good stuff going on. Good stuff going on. Hey, for those of you who were out and about uh, this weekend, if you were out Saturday especially, you would have taken part with your boy, your favorite podcast host, uh, as we went to the Aurora cleanup event that happened. Uh, the headquarters was at 301 Fifth Street. That's the Peace House in Aurora. Uh, and teams met up there, went out and did some cleaning up. Shouts out to all of our friends who uh, took part in that. A lot of community groups and uh, fellow community partners. In addition, uh, I got to meet some of our other friends, uh, which was really cool. So shouts out to Gabriel Bradford, good friend of the show. Eddie Rubio, what up? And then also uh, we got to meet and work with Alderman Ed Bug, Alderwoman Wani Garza, and Alderman Ted Masiakos of the Third Ward. Shout out to friend of the show, Brooke Shanley. She was there too. It was a really good time. Lots of great stuff uh, took place that day. There were raffle prizes, so a lucky youngster won a a Good Morning Aurora t-shirt. Lots of other stuff and a lot of good uh, sponsors as well. Subway, the Walgreens on Union Street, Cotton Seed, Presidential Cleaning Services, and so many others. So shout out to everybody who came and took part in that. All right, so uh, we've got some news to tell you guys about. Today there is the... uh, Community vaccination event, which will be play, uh, taking place at VNA Healthcare, 400 North Highland Avenue. This is a Pfizer vaccine, first dose. Um, getting vaccinated against COVID-19 is the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, and the community. We are here to help. Age 16 and up, minors need to have a uh, parent present. Your second dose appointment will be made when you get your first dose. There is a sign up uh, for that. You can go to our Facebook page and check that out. As you guys may know, should know, hopefully you do know, hopefully you've been taking part in it. We are live, live news every single Monday through Friday on Facebook. Tune in at 8 o'clock a.m. We get down like James Brown. It's a lot of good stuff going on and a lot of fun. I'm just going to give you guys some quick news items um, that you can digest and then let you know what else is going to be happening. We got a uh, interview coming up. Right after the sound of my voice, we've got a talented author that we're going to be speaking to. So get ready for that. Paramount the- uh, Theater presents Earth Day 2021 cleanup downtown Aurora, April 24th from 9 a.m. to noon. Meet at the North Island Center, which is located at 8 East Galena Boulevard. You get tools and vests there and you stay as long as you like. Use the hashtag Earth Day 2021 to show your pride for our beautiful planet. Your great, wonderful local radio news podcast guy me will be there so i'll see y'all there if you are down and about that life the transgender and non-binary awareness panel discussion fairness and equity for a better aurora series presented in partnership with the aurora human relations commissions taking place thursday april 22nd from 7 to 8 30 p.m join the diverse panel to learn about various aspects of the transgender and non-binary experience there is a registration link it's too long for me to read for you guys right now so i will post that on our Facebook page and in our Instagram story. Lastly, Criminal Justice Reform Town Hall, April 29th uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. The new criminal justice reform law includes significant positive changes but may not cover the scope of needed accountability. Our expert panel will sit through this complex law, sift through, excuse me, this complex law so that we will better all, all better understand the gains we've made in areas that still require advocacy. A question and answer will follow. Uh, This is great, and it's brought to us by the DuPage County NAACP, Rainbow Push Coalition, and Chicago North Shore. Lots of great speakers. Dr. Excuse me, Reverend Jeanette Wilson Esquire, Chris Welch, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Illinois, Kim Fox, Cook County State's Attorney, Eric Reinhart, Lake County State's Attorney, Sharon Mitchell, Cook County's Public Defender, and John Mackey, the Director of Innovation for the Alliance for Safety and Justice wonderful stuff all right 
So that's it for the news. Hope that you guys uh, take it easy out there. It's Monday. Let's do this. Have a great day. And that is the news. All righty. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you today? I am blessed. So are we. So are we. Um, first things first, I thank you very much for coming on to our show and uh, sitting down with us and taking some time. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, for our listeners and our viewers, let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, Jerry Collison. I live over on the east side. Okay. Um, but uh, I write under J.L. Collison, kind of as a nom de plume, whatever you want to call it. Okay. How long have you been an author? Uh, since uh, 2014. Wow. Um, I got started with it. Uh, I, I got sick with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then it went chronic. I got bored looking at four walls, and I always had stories in my mind. I've always been a big reader. So... Uh, decided to start telling them and uh, mm. believe it or not I had a teacher in college tell me I should never be a writer that I didn't have what it took for 40 years I believed her really and uh, but I started writing a story just because it's something that's been in my mind for a long time and uh, um, went to a writer's conference to try and figure out what to do with it had no clue and uh, they put me in an interview with an acquisitions editor from a, a publisher that I didn't even know what an acquisitions editor was. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I, I was just talking with him about the publishing process, and uh, at the end of my interview, uh, the next guy didn't show up. He says, we got some extra time. He said, tell me about yourself. Have you written anything? I said, yeah. I said, it's in final edit, but I don't know what to do with it. He said, tell me about it. So I started telling him the story, and uh, um, I didn't even know you're supposed to have a 30-second elevator speech. And about five <laughs> minutes into it, but he listened I, the whole I, time. I, I, I knew nothing. I mean, I, right. I, I was dumber than a box of rocks. Um, but uh, at the end of it, he said, uh, uh, "We haven't seen anything like that in years." He said, "Would you send me the manuscript?" And uh, three months later, I had a contract. That's the story behind Stranded Ramses Lodge. Interesting. And so it uh, um, it just kind of went from there. Where were you born and raised? Uh, down in uh, central Illinois. Okay. Uh, I, well, I grew up outside of Quincy about about an hour. Okay, Quincy, and, Illinois. Uh, yeah. Um, we had a young man on with the morning show this morning from a town called Decatur, Illinois. Oh, yeah. Is Decatur anywhere near Quincy? Oh, uh, no, not really. Decatur's uh, about an hour, hour and a half just due south of us, down 51. Okay. Uh, Quincy's over on the uh, on the Mississippi. What's the story of Quincy, Illinois, and does it have any similarities with Aurora? Um, you know, I, I left that area so many years ago, I, I really couldn't compare them now. Right. The last time I was in Quincy, I got lost, and right. I thought I knew where I was going, <laughs> but it, it has changed a lot. Um, yeah, it's probably similar in, in a lot of aspects in that it's an old industrial town, but, right. uh, you know, industry's gone now. But yeah. it, it is a river town, so there's a, a lot of uh, grain and barge uh, gotcha. traffic there on the river. The Mississippi but, River. Yeah. But then I, I was about an hour from there. A little town called Golden. Golden? Uh, yes. Uh, Never heard of it. Let me I write didn't it. expect it. you would. It's about <laughs> 600 people. Um, wow. And uh, you sneeze downtown, you get home, your mother has a handkerchief for you. So. One of those kind of towns. Okay. Golden, Illinois. So, yeah. Uh, it's a great I, little town. I, yeah. I, I, lo I love Golden. It's, uh, been blessed to learn about a lot of places I'd never heard of by do it, doing this show and interviewing folks mm -hmm. and getting uh, getting to know things. Uh, because that's another reason why, you know, we asked, you asked before I started the show, or before I started recording, about the genesis of the show. Mm -hmm. You know, I also have a big interest in the lives of individuals, uh, you know, not my own. I want to know what people are, what they've experienced and what they've gone through and stuff like that. That means a lot to me to know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a guy who believes that uh, folks are always walking in each other's shoes with the, just the basic American experience, but we just may never meet, you know. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, you better be careful. You may end up being a writer because that's where I get my character. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now you, uh, but you spent many years in Aurora, and you have an Aurora, you have an Aurora story of a history. Uh, let's talk about that. You live here now. Well, I've been here for a little over thirty years. Okay. Um, yeah, my uh, my dad and my brothers owned uh, a pallet recycling company and, okay. and needed some help. I was in South Carolina for sixteen years. I went down to college and found out you didn't have to live through winter like you do up here. And, oh uh, yeah. So I stayed stayed for an extra ten years and. Uh, uh, that's where I learned to talk. So if I get a little bit of an accent here, that's where it came from. Oh, brother, with but the, uh, <laughs> you, it actually fits in really good with this show, actually. <laughs> but um, they talked me into coming up, back up, and and going into into the business with them. And a year and a half later, we sold it, and I haven't gotten back south yet. So. Oh, okay. Uh, growing up, what impact did your mom have in your life? Huge. Huge. Uh, mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, uh, there were six of us kids, and uh, so she had her hands full just taking care of us. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, my mother is is very special in my life. Uh, she's still with us. She's in her nursing home um, down in Lakin. Okay. Um, she's got Parkinson's, so you know she needs needs more help than any of us kids could give her. Right. So. Uh, we get down to see her every every time we get a chance, and try to make a chance. Right. But yeah, she's she's had a huge impact in my life. For young people who think they can take on the world on their own, what's the benefit of family and the structure? You know, that's something that I've I've worked with youth in our church. For years, okay. um, and that's something that we are seeing more and more of a problem in uh, in modern days. Um, that that the, the family structure just is not there that I was blessed to grow up in. Right. Um, uh, you know, too many too many families have both parents working, and when they get home, they're exhausted and don't have the time and the energy to put into their kids. I mean, I, I know one lady that drives an hour and a half to her job. So she drives an hour and a half, works eight hours, drives an hour and a half home. What's left? Right. You know, and I know that that's not, you know, the norm, but most people are going to have a 30-minute commute at least. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, when you get into all of that, you... <clears throat> You're talking about them being away from the home for 10 hours out of the day. Uh, <clears throat> and by the time they get home, they, they have so many things that are in plate that they just don't have the time for the kids. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. I, I know there are many that have to do that. I understand that. Single mothers right. have to do that. Yeah. I, I understand. I'm not being critical when I say this, but it's, it's just the kids pay a price. Yeah, um, you know, in the time that I've been doing this and interviewing folks, the reason why I ask that question and, and, and do ask about the family structure is that so many people, I think, have the idea that they can do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And they can't. No. They can't. No. Um, and, you know, we're not giving life advice on this show, but what I do try to capture from folks is what are the basic building blocks of the structure that you live by and where does family fall into that you know so that's 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 the genesis of that yeah. question of why i asked that um well along with that i'm a christian um and i take my faith very seriously um that is the foundation stone for everything that i do um you know, I, I don't wear it on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. I don't go around, you know, just buttonholing everybody and, and doing all of that. Uh, but at the same time, that's the foundation. And that's something that my mother and my dad both uh, inculcated in me uh, very early on. Yeah. And uh, as a consequence, you know, I have that firm foundation that I build on. And then everything else in my life is predicated on that. 
Um, so that gives me a foundation that a lot of kids don't have. I agree. And, and as a consequence, when you don't have something solid to base your life on, and I'm not going to start preaching. And I'm a Baptist. If I did, I'd have to take an offering. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not going to do that. But, but at, at the same time, that, that is the foundation um, that, that I build my life on. And uh, so it, it gives me something to fall back on when, when things go bad, and they have. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's something that, you know, I have that structure, and uh, I wish more did. So now let's talk, um, oh, well, actually, before we get to that, uh, where'd you go to high school? Uh, Central High, uh, Camp Point, Illinois. Okay. Camp and Point is, uh, well, it's, you know, it's west of, uh, Quin or excuse me, east of Quincy. Okay. Um, about, uh, it's probably 45 minutes from Quincy. Uh, wow. Golden being a small town, you know, we had to, um, Central High covered nine different communities plus farm area so wow oh, so my. A, and we still had 400 students <laughs> now you graduate high school when did you get to South Carolina uh, after high school I worked a year and then I went to Bob Jones University okay in Greenville South Carolina all right uh, oh Greenville oh I love it man I hear nice boy I hear nice things about it I've heard uh, some good it, stuff about it, it my dad loves it it's a great town yeah it's got some rough areas as any of them do um, but uh, I've got a daughter that lives down there, and I've got a, a son that's a Greenville County Deputy Sheriff, canine officer down there. So, okay. Yeah, he, he knows the town very well. Yeah, <laughs> as he should. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, now, you mentioned that writing came to you in the later stages of life. Um, take me back to the before, or like the week, days before you started writing. What was it that made you start writing? Boredom. Sheer boredom. Um, I don't care much for television. Uh, most writing for television is is lacking and I have read so much during my life that 10 minutes into a show I, I can tell you what's going to happen. Right. And you know I, I get bored with it. So um, I, I did a lot of reading, but um, yeah, the Guillain-Barre syndrome um, it causes partial paralysis. And what is that and syndrome? It's uh, Guillain-Barre. It, yeah, it's, okay. uh, um, it's a French name, um, but it, it it came about as as a consequence of a bad virus that I had, and uh, the body, the immune system, attacks itself. And uh, it, it's similar in a lot of aspects to MS, except instead of the central nervous system, it's the peripheral nerves. Okay. So my legs just didn't work. I couldn't walk. And uh, I, I'm back to being able to walk and function now. And people see me, they think everything's fine. Uh, well, that's good. You see me for about 15 minutes and everything is good. I, I walk around the store and by the time I get out, I'm done. And uh, so, you know, um, but at, in the early stages, I, I wasn't able to walk at all. I, oh. I, I got up to where I, I was able to use a walker and, and get around with it and uh, just walk a little ways and, and I'd be exhausted. So, yeah, I was sitting in my lazy boy with my feet up and just not able to do anything. And I was just bored out of my mind. Yeah. So. I had this story in my mind from years ago, and, and it just never left me. What was the but, story? Uh, Strand at Robson's Lodge. You know, it, it was it's the story of uh, two high school seniors that are kidnapped and flown up to upstate Maine and dropped off at a hunting lodge. The pilot hits a goose on takeoff and crashes, leaving them stranded at Robson's Lodge. Oh, it's, a, it's a guy and a girl who have to live together to survive and they have to work together. Um, they knew each other but weren't close beforehand, mm. but, uh, uh, but they're also both Christians. So even right. though the temptations are there, they wanted to maintain their values, so it's clean. And uh, um, 
A friend of mine said that I wrote a love story without making a romance. <laughs> <laughs> but well, it's unique guy, in that regard, so people should check it out just because of that. Uh, well, it, it's a fun tale. I, I don't claim to, to be a great writer. I'm not. Uh, I'm a good storyteller. That, oh. That's what I focus on. How long did it take you to write that? <clears throat> oh, to actually write it? Three months. Hmm. To make it readable? Yeah. <laughs> a couple of years. Now, so you had the story of Stranded in your mind before you actually wrote it. Mm -hmm. What um, what prompted that story? Was there a Romson's Lodge that you met, or did you know a pilot once upon a time? No, Romson is... Um, is a totally made up name. Um, I, I did a search on it and I cannot find anybody with that name. Right. Um, I, I know some friends that have similar names, but um, that one is, is totally made up. Um, I've known pilots since I was a little kid, uh, loved to fly, but uh, uh, that that wasn't the the basis of it because okay. the pilot the pilot's the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the story goes back to probably eighty five eighty six. I don't remember when it was. the The story of the Blue Lagoon was real popular back then. Yeah. And you know I didn't go see it, but I'd heard about it. That's not the sort of Thing I want to watch, right? But um, I'd, I'd heard the story, and it kind of generated a thought in my mind. Well, what if two Christian kids were put in that situation, where they're stranded or marooned or whatever you want to call it, uh, away from anybody and everybody that um, nobody knows what they do, nobody right. knows what happens. Would they be able to maintain their values, or would they succumb? What would the temptations be, and how would they deal with them? And, and I tried to address the book from that vantage point. And who are our characters? Uh, Jed Romson okay. and Elizabeth Sitton. Elizabeth Sitton. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got a very... Elizabeth Sitton puts me in the mind of a very mid-century kind of, kind of tale. Sleepy Town, Elizabeth Sitton. It's got a very traditional kind of thread to it. Uh, yeah, it, it does. Um, the name came from, uh, from a car dealer in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, the Sitton did. Uh, that's where, you know, that one popped up. <laughs> <laughs> and then Elizabeth, uh, uh, I know several Elizabeths, and I just, I like the name, so I, I decided to use it. So now this was your very first book. Yes. All right, so... You write the book, go through the editing process and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what was it like doing that and then going with the publisher? How does you know how does that work? It was first time or doing it. Well, um, that that's kind of goofy. I, I'm blessed in that my wife um, was an English minor in uh, college and is a grammar Nazi, and uh, so she helped me with all of that stuff. Believe it or not, the last grammar I had before I went to college was uh, eighth grade because I, I started Brown County High School who had uh, literature freshman year and, and grammar the second, a sophomore year. Well, then my sophomore year we transferred and I went over to Central. Well, they did it the reverse. They, oh, right. <laughs> they had literature the sophomore year and they had, had grammar the first year. So, Yikes. so by the time I got to college... Um, and, and that's one reason my teacher told me never try to be a writer because, uh, you know, you're, you're, I, you're I, starting I, off backwards, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, because I've been such a big reader, that telling the story was the easy part. It was the a lot of the fine stuff that that I struggled with, and and the wife helped me with that. And then I ran it past another editor too, just to have her kind of fine-tune and mm -hmm. look for plot holes and look for other issues and things like that. Um, and then, you know, like I said, I went to this writer's conference. I had, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, all, I, all I knew is I had this story and I knew didn't know what to do with it. I thought I would self-publish because I didn't think I was 
you know, capable of having a publisher be interested. Why not? You know, because of my college teacher. You know, she told me, you know, not to try. So mm. uh, I, di I didn't think that it was anything, but I just had the story that, yeah, and I wanted to get it out there, see what somebody else thought. And it's empowering, isn't it, doing something that you don't think you can do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Um, you know, and, and I still, I don't claim to be a, a good writer. I, I have people tell me I can write. Well, okay, I can tell stories. And I, I got that idea from Louis L'Amour. Um, oh, my man. I knew, I knew we were going to be friends the minute you walked in here. <laughs> Louis L'Amour, uh, arguably the greatest Western author that ever put pen to paper. Do you know that he also write? He wrote crime stories, and uh, I knew he wrote more than other stuff too. Yeah, he he wrote more than yeah. westerns. I didn't know um, what the other genres at, were, but yeah. At at one point or another, I've had every book that he wrote, and uh, uh, I'd have all of them except a few of them fell apart. My right. kids stole some of the others. So. Yep. But uh, yeah, I, I've I've read everything he's he's written. He uh, isn't fantastic. I, At one point in time in my life, the only way that I could have peace was by going to my local library, and I would sit in there and I would read Louis L'Amour books until I read them all. Louis L'Amour, National Geographic, and Reader's Digest mm -hmm. are the three publications that got me through the absolute worst times of my life. You better be careful. You're going to end up writing. I might, yeah. I love writing. I do. Yeah. I love to write. Uh, my my problem is though is that I tend to I have a hard time like condensing it into it. I'll I will just go on and on and on. You know. So that's the that's the thing. I'm not able to um, I guess effectively structure my writing to uh, bring it to an end. But I uh, man, yeah. I I write. Um. That's where editing comes in. You know, good writing isn't good writing, it's good rewriting. Mm. I, I forget who said that, but uh, since I can't remember, uh, I'll steal it. Yeah, <laughs> it works <laughs> but, right now. But anyhow, Louis Lamore said that he doesn't think of himself in, in the vein of a writer, um, but in the old or, uh, oral storyteller right. tradition. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I I got to thinking one day I could do that, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, that's so that's what I did. I just started telling a story, but I I did it on paper. So you write the book. Um, Oprah Winfrey knocks on the door the next day, and you get the deal. How does it? How does it? <laughs> yeah, right. How does it yeah, work? In your dreams. Yeah. Uh, well, there are thirty thousand books published in the United States every year. Wow. Um, more than that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that isn't including the self-published ones. So yeah, you're, you're going to find that getting published is not as easy as you would think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the publisher that, that picked this up, Morgan James, um, it's a mid-sized publisher out of New York, um, they turned down over 5,000 um, submissions every year and end up publishing about 150. Wow. Um, so, and they don't have just open submission. You know, that's that's books that, that they choose to take a look at. Right. Um, and so for, for it to be picked up is um, unusual. Yeah, and, and especially something that I didn't even pitch it. I, I I wasn't there trying to pitch the book because I had I had no idea what I had I had no idea what I was doing with it, um, but uh, what most new authors are doing now is going to KDP, which is Amazon, or right. going to Ingram Spark, or going to Lulu, or uh, <clears throat> or if they're just going to do. Um, Ebooks, they go to Smash Words or Draft to Digital, or uh, there are several others that uh, aggregators that, that will take them and, and self publish them for you. Right. Uh, when you do that, well, you've got to do all of the editing, you've got to do your own cover, you've got to do your own design work, mm. all of that. Um, it, it's a process. 
Um, and my other three that I have published at the moment, um, I self-pubbed uh, because I wanted control. When you go with a publisher, you give up control, um, which uh, there are pluses and minuses. Sure. You know, yeah, you've got to you've got to weigh it out and decide what is the best for for what it is that you're writing. Uh, what's the best fit? Right. And my my second two are both uh, one's a novelette, and one's a novella. You know, short works. They're hard to get to a publisher without going in an anthology. Well. If you go into an anthology, you have no control on what else goes in there with it. Right. And I don't want to have some of my writing coming from a Christian perspective, whether it's written as a, quote, Christian book or not. Um, I don't want it put next to something that I wouldn't want one of my kids reading. I, I completely understand so, that, certainly. So as a consequence to that, I decided to self-pub them. And uh, then my my latest one is just a, a children's book. It's illustrated. Let's see the so you've got uh, underneath stranded the other two. Those are the recent ones we're talking about. Yeah, um, I've got uh, my donkey and the master, which is a, a novelette. It's a, it's a recounting of the gospel story through the eyes of a friend of Joseph of Nazareth. Okay. So you're seeing the gospel unfold through a family friend's vantage point and his totally donkey totally different viewpoint there yes really different okay yeah, his his donkey becomes the center part of the story um, it's his donkey that ties everything and keeps him connected in um, and then Rotund Roland um, this is a it's an anti-bullying love story uh, about a kid with uh, gigantism who is uh, bullied because he's bigger than everybody else. And, right. and uh, he's picked on uh, for, for being fat and uh, for, you know, uh, it, it begins, my name is Roland, but that's not what anybody called me. Roly, Roly Poly, Tubby, Toby, Toby Lard, All Lard of Butt. Yeah. And, and it goes on like that. Um, you know, the, the bullying is, is such a problem. And, and I wanted to address it from that, from that vantage point. So I wanted to be able to have control on what happened with this one. Uh, my Donkey and the Master, actually, I wrote to give away as an e-book. And then I had people who wanted it in, in paper, so I, I did go to print with it. Um, That's the kind of guy I am. Uh, I mean, I need my books, and, I, you know, I want to. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, that's I me, too. I, I've got a Kindle. Uh, Don't even use it, I bet, do you? Does it <laughs> collect dust? I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> my son gave me a Kindle because I've got over 3,000 books in my house. And, and uh, he kept telling me, he said, you, you need something. You can keep those books in one place. Well, okay. I had a bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife laughs because I used to go to garage sales looking for bookshelves and I'd go home with books. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so I've got them in boxes and bags and stacked wow. and piled. And, Sir, I'm the uh, exact same yeah. way. I got books on my desk. <clears throat> I got books on top of books. I got yeah. books in my kitchen. I got books. My goodness gracious, I got so many books. I got more books than I have space to hold the books. Yeah. yeah. And then Mouse in the House is my latest. It's uh, I like that. I like that. That one is, uh, I, I'm blessed because I had a chance to get connected with Donna Sutherland. Donna is one of two artists that were hired by Disney. Sutherland or Sitter? Sutherland. Sutherland, okay. Yeah. S-E-T-T-E-R-L-U-N-D. Okay. But Donna worked... Uh, she and another artist worked with the model that they used to create Tinkerbell for Peter Pan. Um, Julia Roberts? No. That's the movie. I'm, no, no I, I know. Yeah, yeah the, the, the cartoon. The animated, yeah. Dis, the Disney uh, animated version. But anyhow, she, uh, um, she did this, and uh, the artwork in here is fabulous. But it's, uh, you know, the... the, the the people, the, the the dog and the cat, and the um, I, I I don't know if, if that shows up on here or not, but uh, the little baby sitting there is my granddaughter. 
We can zoom in on that. Well, let's see here. I like that. Oh, that's... Okay. Now that's your granddaughter sitting there. Um, well, what what Donna did is uh, um, when you know, when I uh, sent her the the story and uh, she was trying to to put it together. Um, she asked if I had my granddaughter's picture because it's dedicated to to uh, my granddaughter Evie. It's uh, because when I wrote the story, I, I saw a mouse in my kitchen, and you know writers have goofy imaginations. I saw this mouse, and I got to thinking, you know, what if? And, uh, and it just kind of blew up from there. That's good. So, uh, so you I, took creativity so, and a random incident and made yeah. a book out of it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So I, I just wrote the story and I sent it to my daughter, having no idea if it was any good or not. And I said, "Read this to Evie and tell me uh, what she thinks." And, and uh, I mean, it was—I'm an adult with a big vocabulary. I don't write for children, so I had to—I had to tone it down a good bit because I use big words and things like that. But anyhow, uh, Esther wrote me back and she said she giggled. All the way through, so it is. So that's the test. It is. <laughs> it is dedicated to Evie, who giggled, and uh, so when when I told Donna that she wanted to know if I had a baby picture of her, so she took the baby picture and created this character out of that. So, that's excellent. The artwork in that book is very nice. Oh, it it is phenomenal. Very good, sir. It it is phenomenal, and that that does more, you know, I think for that story than than the story does. But, uh, yeah, that, that was a fun, fun one to do. Um, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen take place in Aurora in your time here? Ooh. Growth. Okay. Um, uh, the, the growth has been phenomenal okay. in, in the city. I, you know, we went from, I think it was about 88,000 when I moved here. To we're over two hundred thousand now, yep. um, and in that time, there's there have been a lot of changes. Um, it's um, I'm a country boy, and my roots are in the country. Mm -hmm. I miss the country, but Aurora has been a, a good place to live. Um, yeah, there are things I'd like to see changed, but sure. that's always the case. Uh, our police department here, I think, is phenomenal. Um, my wife and I um, joined the Citizens Police Academy. All right, well uh, done, well done. Uh, quite some number of years ago, uh, she was class 10, I was class 11, I think, and we're up to the 30s now. Um, no, we're up to the, yeah, the 30s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I learned a lot about it. I learned a lot about the city as a consequence. Um, you know, we hear, it's not so much anymore, but when we first moved here, we heard of what a rough city Aurora was. Right. And, and we heard, you know, about the crime, and we heard about all the shootings, and we heard a lot of this stuff. Well, a couple of years ago, we went a whole year without a single homicide. Right. And uh, our police department has been very, very proactive. Um, and it, not in a jackboot type of, uh, of a situation, but they're just responsive to the people. And um, the, the policing here has been, I think, has been great. Um, the city government has been for the most part, has been trying to reach out to the people and, right. and with community groups and things like that. Early on, not so much. I've heard that uh, same thing. I've heard that same thing. There was an um, interview to a gentleman, and he said, you know, he's been in the city like 50 years, and he said the exact same thing. He said he only really can uh, see and recall an, an, an outreach of any kind from city government to the people in the last, I think he mentioned like 10 or 15 years, just something like that, uh, something way more recent. Well, David Stover, when he resigned as police chief um, and then a year or so later ran for mayor, um, he was the, I think he was the, the genesis of that. 
Uh, he did a lot to turn the city more toward the people rather than uh, rather the top down. Tried to get more uh, uh, citizen input and citizen uh, activity. Uh, the neighborhood watch program, which has been since disbanded, yeah. Um, but that was was in place, and and we were real active with that early on. But we got broken into, and as a consequence, you know, we got interested in, in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we started with the neighborhood watch, and Good. and uh, worked with uh, several officers there, and then uh, later on uh, had the opportunity to get in the Citizens Police Academy, and we're active in in a local. Uh, uh, group in in Ward Three, yeah. and and try to stay active there with the with the neighbors. So uh, you're a and, Ward and Three the, guy. Yeah. All right. We had, well we had a lot of fun in Ward Three Saturday, doing some Aurora Do, cleanup doing stuff. Cleanup, yeah. yeah. And your uh, uh, Alderman Messiakos yes. was out there. Good yeah. man. Good man. Yeah. Yeah, Ted and, I, Ted and I kind of got to be friends. We kind of do this. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a guy to do that too. He, he and yeah. but here's the thing. Uh, and I'll go to the next question, but. You know, I'm the kind of guy who I need my officials to have a little sand. Yeah. I'm not going to be right about everything. Hell yeah. Uh, absolutely and, not. And, yeah. and I'd like that about Ted. I yeah. was, you know, Ted will, he'll listen to you, he'll hear you out. But if the last point of it don't make no sense, yeah. he'll ask you about it again. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. About, oh. yeah. And he's been, he's been very responsive. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not critical of him at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. We we see differently on some things. Okay, sure. that that's that's cool. Sure, I, I got no problem with that as long as he listens yep. and he does. Uh, the man so, was out there with an orange vest and a and a yeah. and a uh, garbage pickup thing doing his part for the city on Saturday. I yeah. I loved it. Uh, I I wish that that we could have uh, been a part of that too, but uh, I I just can't do it anymore. Right, and it bugs me. Yeah, but <laughs> I got to leave to you young guys. <laughs> um. So, uh, so now, David Stober, police chief, became mayor. Engagement has increased between yeah. the city and everything like that. We've still got some time. Uh, you know, there's always more you can be doing. How do you feel about the way things are currently in the city and then going forward for the rest of the year? Uh, I'm encouraged by a lot of it. I, I think... I think sometimes we get enamored with all of the technology and all of the the stuff that we spend too much money on things that you know the, they're the bright shiny object right now and, and we get all excited about that and I, I will give the administration um, a lot of credit for bringing in business and and uh, doing a lot to to foster jobs and things like that. We don't have nearly the empty buildings that we used to have. We still have too many of them downtown. Yeah. But that was due to previous administrations that ran small business out. Yeah. Um, and that is, they're trying to turn that around. I, I, I give them credit for that. You see a lot of empty uh, buildings, but you see a lot of them being worked on. You see yeah. guys in there with the hard hats. They're yeah. doing something in there. Right. Yeah. And and I, I, I definitely am, am uh, in favor of that and encouraged by that. So I, I think we're going the right direction. Um, there are some things I'd like to see changed. I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more focus on non-tech. Um, I'm a dinosaur. I know that. Um, but, Kids love dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> I have an eight-year-old. I'm kind of the same. I've, I've got some, uh, yeah, I understand. Well, when I was in college, um, my wife and my sister were both math majors, computer science minors, and I carried their homework to the computer on campus. Okay, that gives you an idea that, uh, okay, I, I'm not a kid anymore. Right, uh, yeah. And that computer took up two rooms in the basement of a guy's dorm. Holy cow. Um, and there are well over a million times the computing power in this thing. Yes. That we're in that. Um, there, There is more memory on you here mm -hmm. than that thing ever dreamed of having. Yep. And, uh, you know, 
so being able to look at that, you know, I've always been a, you know, while I was able to, I was always a hands-on type of a guy. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, I never was a desk driver. You know, I drove a truck for a long time, and <clears throat> and I did the pallet work, and I, I worked with other companies. I was always in operations, so the tech stuff kind of I got left behind. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of emphasis on, on everything is technology, technology, mm -hmm. technology. And I think that's great, but I think sometimes we're forgetting the other stuff that is just as important. I agree with that. And, and uh, I, I'd like to see a little bit more emphasis put back towards some of that. Uh, we get enamored with the, you know, the shiny mm -hmm. over here and, and kind of forget the other stuff. I, I think there needs to be a little more balance. I agree. I see a lot of businesses now have uh, tried to become so cutting edge. They've tried to be so mm -hmm. hip and with it now that they lose. You know, a lot of the business fundamentals that really matter, yeah. you can't download. There's not an app for that. There's not an app for, there's not an app for timeliness. There's not an app for good customer service. There is not an app for being able to solve the problem of what happens when this beam crashes and you got guests in your establishment. There is no yeah. downloadable password for that. So to your point, uh, there should also be the strong, hands-on uh, strengthening of just those basic principles that, that apps and technology will never be able to replace. Well, there's still there's still a lot of room for manufacturing mm -hmm. in in America, right? And and we've chased a lot of it overseas. <clears throat> well, some of it is coming back, um, and I would like to see a little more interest in pulling some of that back in to come along with the tech. Okay. Um, I mean that's that's just me, Ed. But then again, like I said, I'm a dinosaur. I, I'm a guy that. I never felt like I was working if I didn't get dirty. And uh, I, yeah, I, I understand that. I understand that. So I, I haven't worked in a number of years now. <laughs> so I got this job a long time ago. I used to work uh, downtown Chicago at this company. Uh, I was their like IT help guy. I remember telling my dad about it. He was like, "What do you do all day?" I was like, "Well, we answer these tickets if somebody needs someone." He was like, "He's like, do you work?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, my dad was an iron worker, you know. Yes. So yeah, he he yeah. um yeah, yeah, he's either suspended or welding or something like that. And he was like, "Where's the work part of it?" Yeah. I'm like, "Man, it's hard, you know. You got to yeah, that's <laughs> not work. Exactly. Yeah. That's not work." Um <laughs> and and I do this uh, right, yeah. the day and night and now. <laughs> send and that's it. Um next question. What does America mean to you? America is an ideal. It was founded on the principles of freedom, liberty, and justice. Was it perfect? No. Is it perfect? Definitely not. Have we made improvements? Yeah. We've also gone the wrong direction. Um, America is a land of opportunity, um, but that is being squelched. I, America is the country that, oh, who was it had the song, Neil Diamond, a number of years ago, had the song, Coming to America, They're Coming to America. And that's something that for so many years people wanted to come to America for opportunity, not for freebies. They wanted to come to America for freedom and for liberty. I've got good friends that escaped from behind the Iron Curtain. Um, your generation doesn't know what the Iron Curtain was. I do. It was the, uh, oh, I know what it was. 
as opposed to others of my generation who don't know. Um, like I said, I was reading National Geographic and Reader's Digest. The Iron <laughs> Curtain is uh, what befell all of Europe post-World War II. It was communism and all of its various machinations from Hungary all the way down to Italy even. But that's what the Iron Curtain was. Yeah. And up through uh, up. Germany. Oh yeah, which Germany, which is split. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, so many places. Romania, Estonia. Uh, yep. My goodness gracious. There are yep. a lot of countries. It even encroached in many places in France, all over the place. Yep. Yeah. And, yep. uh, well, we're bringing it to America now. And I, I, I hate to see that. I, I fear for my grandchildren um, because they're not going to see the America I grew up in. Um, right. And again, it wasn't perfect. Right. Um, but I think we're going the wrong direction. What should the young uh, who are going to be that next generation of not only writers, but also, um, you know, people, maybe they're, you know, this is going to be for my son when he grows older. What should that next generation of Americans, the young, be focused on? Where should their attentions be as we go forward? Read history. Okay. Um, read some of the uh, some of the founding fathers. Uh, read Jefferson. You know, don't get into the cancel culture idea that Jefferson was a slave owner, so therefore he can't be trusted, he can't be uh, believed in. Did you know he was an abolitionist? I did. I also know that Jefferson is the guy who basically created our Navy. He said, we will not pay tribute to the Sultan of who? No. Our ships are either going to yeah. be able to pass through there freely or we'll, we'll give them hell. And he did well, that. Jefferson and Washington both are, are criticized now by by those who don't know their history because they were slave owners. Both of them inherited their slaves. They didn't buy any. And what people don't understand is, is by law, they could not free their slaves. Washington was able to when he died. But because of manumission, they were not allowed to. And when, by the time Jefferson died, that law had been changed back again where that even in his will he could not free his slaves. So a, a lot of what a lot of what goes on now in in what kids are hearing in school and stuff like that is so selectively edited. They don't understand because they try and judge what happened in the seventeen hundreds by twenty first century. And you can't do that. You have to judge that time period by that time period. And understand that there were things that were wrong. Right. But that doesn't mean that everything gets thrown out. I, uh, th th there, there are so many others. Read Locke. Read Hume. Read, uh, uh, go on back and read Plutarch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and read some of the, some of the old... Uh, uh, Plutarch's Lives was the most read book outside of the Bible in colonial America. Right. And that's what people based what they should, you know, what they should be like because they learned what it was that people back in Rome were like. Right. Okay. And we don't have that foundation. The modern education, you know, too much of, of history is based on what people can remember. And too little is taught of what went before. Mm. And, and that doesn't give the foundation that, that our young generation needs to be able to go on and, and to carry on. So you know what question comes next, right? Your, your favorite book. Oh, jeez. Outside of the Bible? Outside of the Bible. I can't give you one. 
What's the one you're thinking about? Well, the first one that pops into my head is Hondo. Uh, Hondo? Are you talking about the same Hondo that they made a movie of William starring William. John Wayne? <laughs> oh, the book is so much better. Forget I, the movie yet. As they typically are. Man, you uh, are my... you. Well, you know, when... when we got to hang out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> the, the difference between a book and a movie is like looking at an iceberg. Yeah. You see this little thing up here, and two-thirds of it is down here. Right. And, you know... Uh, Hondo, holy cow. But Riley's luck would be right in there with it. But then... <sighs> Riley's uh, luck. Right another the another Lamore. Okay. Book. Uh, and the man from Skibbereen. Uh, okay. Another Lamore. Uh, but then... I'm also a fan of Tom Clancy. Um, and... He wrote I, Patriot Games. Patriot Games. Kate, that's right. Um, Red Storm Rising. And a, a number of others, mm -hmm. um, but then I also enjoy Ellsworth Thane, a woman who wrote a series uh, following a family in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, okay. and it goes through a number of generations, and each one correlates with a war or with one of them. It's the, the phony war between World War One and World War Two. But she examines the war and stuff from a woman's point of view, right. uh, which is a, a little different than you see, you know, most things. Um, I, I don't I probably read 30,000 books for me to pick one. Yeah. I know, I know, and, and you know what? It's it's tough when you when I do that and ask, but um, what you've what you've said though provides that answer for that question because Honda was the first thing she came with. That means it stuck with you. But you also mentioned that Louis L'Amour and his writing itself yep. stuck with you, and it, well, it it brings me back. Uh, last night I watched I watched one of the greatest westerns ever made. A movie that I love and adore, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Great movie. Mm -hmm. Great movie. That's why I like John Wayne's still in my mind right now with Hondo. <laughs> like, that's a good movie, too. Oh, yeah. I have it on yeah. VHS still. I don't have a VCR <laughs> player anymore, but yep, still got it. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent one. Um, I, I thought they did a, a, a very good job translating that one to the screen. Oh, yeah. But the reason for that is Lamore wrote the screenplay. I didn't know that. So he was, uh, I, there were others who worked on with him, but, uh, but he was involved in that. So hmm. he kept it true right. to the, you know, uh, To its roots. To, to, too many of them, you, you read the book and you watch the movie and you think they're totally different stories. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. so. <clears throat> um, so the show ends on a positive note. What is your message to the people of Aurora today? Do right. Um, yeah, if you do that, the rest of it falls into place. You know, treat your neighbor as you want to be treated. You know, just um, um, it's not all me; it's us. Very true. Yeah, it can't be all us. It has to be. It can't be just a me thing. It has to be an us thing. Yeah. Um, we appreciate you coming on to the show. Well, hey, I appreciate the chance to be here. Yeah, yes. we appreciate you talking to us. It was really good to uh, learn from you and learn about you and learn your story. Well, yep. It's. Uh, I'm just an old country boy that uh, keeps trying to do what's right. Well, you're doing a you're doing a really good job. You're doing a really good job, and I wish you, and on behalf of the show, we wish you uh, much success with everything you're doing, and a continued blessed, uh, blessed 2021. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, for our listeners and viewers, please check out author J. L. Callison. Yes. Okay. You know what? So I'm looking at it, and uh, as I thought that like 
JL was your name. And it, <laughs> I was like, JL, you know, like yeah. it, it just kind of, you know how it is with the emails right. and all yeah. that. Yeah. Sure. Like JL, I was telling myself all day, oh, we got JL this morning. JL's coming in. <laughs> it's Jerry. Well, Jerry, Jerry but I, I go by J, uh, Jerry or JL. All right. Um, I, I started, uh, started using JL, you know, when I started writing because um, I was looking for something that people would see and kind of it would click. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, where Jerry just kind of glosses over, but JL just kind of, you know, and talking to some people that that seem to to be a, a good fit. Mm-hmm. Another thing, reason for that is um, uh, by going with JL, people don't know if I'm male or female until they pick up the book. That's right. So therefore, I attract an audience like Stranded. You know, the, this this is a it, it, it's an adventure, it's an action adventure story, but it has a, a very strong love interest. Mm-hmm. I wrote the action for the guys, I wrote the love interest for the girls. So by going with JL, they pick it up and they look at it. Well, they don't know what vantage point it's coming no, from. No, it's perfect. Totally. Like it looks, can you hold up Rotund sure. Roland again? Yep. I look at JL Callison. It's per. It's it's very clean. It's very quick hit. Very clean. Captures your attention. It captures your eye. It's 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 perfect. This uh, cover was designed by Isaac Stevens uh, from Greenville, South Carolina. A uh, very talented young graphic artist. Yeah. Um, I had. This book was a year and a half after the book was done in trying to find a cover. Um, I, I, I draw stick figures and you can't tell what they are. Mm-hmm. So I, I needed somebody that was creative. And um, my daughter, I, I was giving up. Uh, my daughter uh, suggested that I reach out to some of the kids that were in school with her. And, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, she referred me to Isaac and a couple of others. Uh, well, the others said, yeah, I'd like to, you know, talk with you about it. And well, Isaac sent me this just as a, as a concept. Winner. <laughs> and bingo. I mean, uh, that, that just tells the story. you got you know, all these little skinny things and you got rolling. And, it's perfect. And, you know, it, it just catches you. Like you said, it catches the, the, the attention right there. Yeah. Um, um, well, again, we wish you... So. We wish you the best, and we're glad you came on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, It's a blessing to be here. All of our listeners and viewers, please check out author J.L. Callison. Um, And where where can they find your works? Uh, JLCallison.com. Okay. uh, Or anything is on Amazon. Uh, A couple of them are on Barnes & Noble, uh, Walmart.com. Basically, any place you can buy books online. Uh, Rotund Roland and... uh, my donkey and the master are um, are both on Amazon, uh, not any place else because I publish through Amazon. Gotcha. But uh, mouse in the house for the love of peanut butter, you've got to have the whole thing because there are several mouse in the houses. All right. Whereas mouse in the house for the, for love, the love of, of peanut, peanut butter, butter is available uh, through my website or off of Amazon um, or any place you. Can you can buy a book online. Excellent. You guys uh, check. If, if you get it off my website, I sign and personalize everything I send out. Get them off the website, you guys. And remember, um, do write. That is the message of the day from author J.L. Callison. And we will see you guys back here for another great show tomorrow. Be blessed.